Hello ghouls and gals. After the absolute bomb that was last time, I'm going to get back on track with what you guys want to see, which is of course the good old sword and board world of fantasy. We're getting back into gear with another one of our history videos as well, dealing with the biggest and the baddest and the sneakiest boys in all of Warhammer, the Greenskins. Now, I know the title says Orcs, but really we're going to be covering the Greenskins as a race here, rather than just the big boys, because technically they are very similar creatures and are rarely separate from one another. But, with that little correction out of the way, let's dive into our mean, green, rampaging machines. Unlike men, elves, dwarves, or lizardmen, the Greenskins did not come from the great plan of the Old Ones. They weren't lovingly crafted to live in the Old World, but they appeared near the dawn of creation all the same. No one is quite sure where they came from, or how they came to be. Some think they were just a species of fungi that existed before sentient life, and just so happened to evolve at the same time. Others think they might be a plague brought from outer space to always harass the peaceful civilizations of the world. The Orc Shamans would tell you Gork and Mork came down from the sky to populate the world with Orcs and Goblins, so I guess there's more credence to the latter theory. If we were in the days before AOS, we could argue that the Greenskins in fantasy were similar to those in 40k, but GW has severed that connection pretty neatly. No matter how they came about, the Orcs have been around for as long as the Old Ones. When they found these undesirables populating the world, the Old Ones sent out their warriors, the Lizardmen, to clean them up. While we might see the oldest foes in Warhammer Fantasy as the Lizards and Chaos, it seems that the Blue Scaly Boys and the Green Planty Lads were fighting long before then. No matter how many Greenskins the Lizards cut down as well, they couldn't wipe the Orcs from the face of the Earth. For thousands of years, the Greenskins continue their dominance over the world. They don't invade places like Ulthuan, at least not yet, nor do they take any temple cities of the Lizards, but especially in the Old World, they've got their finger in every pie possible. For this time, most of the other powers of the world either ignore the Greenskins, or just keep them at bay. They've given up on trying to kill our boys. The Dark Elves saw their biggest embarrassment when they tried to wipe out the Black Guff Night Goblins, and in a desperate move, the Goblins poured Madcap Mushrooms into their squig pens, sending the Dark Elves into an undignified retreat from the maddened Red Beasts. It didn't all turn out well for the Gobbos though, as their trusty saviours soon turned on them in their madness. Here, it's probably worth mentioning that a lot of this history is going to be tied to the other races and factions in the world. It's not that orcs don't have a rich history of their own, but basically no one remembered to write it down, and so most of the information we have on them comes from the elves, dwarves, humans, and so on. And it always seems to paint our green heroes in a bad light for whatever reason. Anyway, the next major event we have to deal with is the War of the Beard, not because the Greenskins got involved between the ultimate battle of dwarves and elves, but because, after the fact, when elves had left and the dwarves being wrecked by earthquakes and volcanic eruptions, the Greenskins saw their chance to regain some loot and some land. They sacked the empty elven cities and made war with many dwarf holds, taking Karak and Gore and naming it Red Eye Mountain. This is a bit of a golden age for the orcs really, as they're free to do as they please, and the dwarves are left on the back foot consistently. They're having a solid time. Karak Varn is the second dwarf hole to fall in this period, and is called Kragmere from that point on. The orc lair, known as Mount Bloodhorn, is also made around this time too, and from it an army takes over the watchtowers of Mad Dog Pass. More dwarven settlements fall, and for a while it seems that orcs and goblins might finally be rid of the stunty plague in their lands. Things only get better when Thunder Mountain blows up, further pressuring the dwarves with armies of trolls. Sadly though, nothing good lasts forever, and the dwarves regain control of much of their lost territory. They begin to rebuild, but even if our heroes lost the battle, they have not yet lost the war. Elsewhere in the world, Nagash excavates the Cursed Pit. Not wanting to be turned into mindless savages, our orcs and goblins flee west, hoping to escape the necromancy of the south. Many sadly don't make it out alive, and are left to serve Nagash's great hordes. The orcs' luck with necromancy didn't fare much better when they came up against the humans of Strigos. With the help of Cadon, a necromancer equipped with the crown of Nagash, the goblins and orcs are sent fleeing to the Darklands, and the humans continue their expansion in this new empire. Orcs may be down, but they're never out, and later they recapture Karak Varn for themselves once more, and kill the great dwarf Kadrin Redmane. Not only do they win one over on their old stunted enemies, but they reduce the Strigos Empire to nothing more than rubble with a huge war of savage orcs. Kadon is slain, and the Empire becomes what is now known as the Badlands. 
For hundreds of years, orcs and dwarves battle over settlements, but our green team managed to secure a huge win when they finally drive the dwarves out of Karak Eight Peaks. If it wasn't for those pesky Skaven, they'd have won out entirely, but the rats are continuously battling for control as well. Shortly after, the war boss Dork leads an army to Karak Draz after he's beaten out of Karak Asgal. He takes the dwarf hold and names it Black Crag. The orcs nearly even got so far as taking the dwarf capital of Karazakarak at one point, capturing the High King Logan Proudbeard. Sadly, it wasn't to be, and they were defeated. Another couple of hundred years of war ensue when suddenly the weak and puny Humis from the lands west of the World's Edge Mountains start fighting back against orc raids. In a series of wars, the orcs are driven back from these lands by an alliance of Humis and Stunties, which is led by a shiny bloke with a big shining hammer. Seeing that the Empire is no easy pickings, orcs instead make way for Tilia, and about 500 years after being battered at the Battle of Blackfire Pass, they return to the human world, sacking many cities before they're sent away, when with some making homes in the Apuccini Mountains. Those same greenskins later descend on Bretonia, or at least what would become known as it. Orcs and Bretoni tribes fight for hundreds of years until another stinking Humi, hero called Giles Le Breton, comes in and kicks the Greenskins out, founding yet another so-called nation in prime raiding territory. Guillaume, the third Bretonian king, wipes out the orcs in the north of the country, and for centuries it feels like the Great Green Age is over. No orc hero can make headway in the lands of the humans, even though many try. That is, until one great war boss known as Gorbad Ironclaw unites the Broken Tooth and Ironclaw clans and sets his sights on the Empire. Ironclaw might be considered the most powerful war boss in all of history. Bursting into the Empire with a huge war, he put Avaland and the Moot to the torch and took the major cities of Averheim and Nuln. He slew the Elector Count of Solund and wiped the region from the world. Finally, his tirade seems as if it's going to be stopped at the Battle of Grunberg, but Ironclaw was only wounded and still managed to win the day. Pushing back the Empire to Altdorf, where he laid siege and had the Emperor eaten by a wyvern. Even with these many victories, Ironclaw couldn't take Altdorf, and as the siege continued, most of his troops just got bored and left. Orcs need a fight, you see, and they're not going to stick around when they can be out trying to find one. Gorbad is forced to retreat, where a massive army of dwarves waits around the corner to try and finish him off. He's last seen atop a pile of dwarven bodies, still fighting even as his army lays dead around him. It'll be many centuries before another green hero rises, and until then, we see orcs hunted in Britonia by King Lewin Orkslayer, retreat from the dwarves at the Battle of Black Falls, and they're even pushed out of the north when the Great War Against Chaos comes. Some orcs actually do join Chaos during this time, but most just try and fight the weird half-naked Humies. Perhaps the greatest embarrassment in orc history is at the Siege of Monte Castello, where 500 mercenaries held out against 10,000 orcs. I did say another green hero would rise though, didn't I? And one did rise indeed in the glorious fatty Grom the Paunch, who rampaged through the Dwarf and Empire lands before finally taking his army to Ulthwan. There he was defeated, but not before he let those poncy knife ears know they weren't safe from the green tide, not by any means. Back in the old world, as we get closer to the current day in Warhammer Fantasy, humans and dwarves once again find themselves beset by the never-ending onslaught of greenies. The Broken Nose tribe raid Karak Azul, capturing war machines that they used to cut through all the way to Avaland. The Bretonians find themselves bested by Morglum Neck Snapper at the Battle of Death Pass, leading the war boss to say, Let them tell the king, the east belongs to the orcs, the east belongs to Morglum, the east is green. Morglum isn't the only warlord to see success during this time. Nashrak forms an almighty war that could have taken the dwarf capital, but two of his most vital warriors left before he was ultimately defeated in Broken Leg Gully. Gorfang Rotgut and Morglum Necksnapper ally to sack Karak Azul, taking the Dwarf Lord's son, shaving him, and tattooing a symbol on his head. Azag the Slaughterer begins terrorising the Northern Empire after being inspired to do so by voices in his head. He makes it as far as Ostwald before he's taken down by the Grand Master of the Night's Panther. As you can probably see, this is a time of fleeting greatness for Orcs, as many rise to challenge the Dwarves or the Empire, but few make it for more than a few years before their war erodes or they're just killed in battle. Some can't even find true glory on the fields of battle. Spinny Backstabber, a Night Goblin Warlord, destroys only some farms before Kurt Helborg gets a steam tank to crush him. However, the Greenskins keep coming back. In the Drakwald, Night Goblins stir, and in the south of the Empire, once more a Grand Orc war looks to burn as much human territory as it can. This leads to the third Battle of Blackfire Pass, where Vorgar's Iron Jaw manages to kill the Mad Count of Avaland, but can't best Karl Franz. 
from that day until the world's last day, wherever you may tread, you're likely not too far from a greenskin threat. Unlike the Skaven, who operate silently unless they're ready to strike, orcs are born, want to scrap, scrap, and die. Their history, as you can probably tell by this video, is pretty uncoordinated because they've never really set out to accomplish much apart from fight everything else that shares the world with them. If they didn't grow from the ground, they would have been wiped out by now, but I love them no matter what because they're always going to keep coming back and trying to win the day. Nothing can break their will, and that's an attitude I believe we could all take with us. Let me know what you think of the Orcs and which history you want to see next. I think I'm going to stick with fantasy for a while as each time I dip into 40k, the videos just bomb. So let me know what you want to see. And I've also been thinking about Age of Sigmar too, so as always just leave a comment. Until next time though, keep your choppers high.